Firstly, what is pain? Uh, I'm going to talk for about half an hour, then we'll go through the cases. If you have questions, you're welcome to go online and we'll answer your questions as we go and, and as the topics come up and at the end. Basically, pain is defined as a sensory and emotional experience. So firstly, there's the nociception, which is the sensory part of it, going up to the sensory cortex. And the signals also go to other parts of the brain to give us that emotional distressing signals. Pain is a two-way street. In fact, it's more like a multi-lane highway. And what we've got is inhibition and excitation at different parts in the body. So in the brain, we have neurons within the brain that excite pain and inhibit pain. We've got the brain influencing the spinal cord, and this causes inhibition and excitation. Then we've got interneurons within the spinal cord, so at different levels they come down, sometimes they excite pain, sometimes they inhibit pain. And finally, we've got pain being inhibited and excited by the dorsal horn as well. And then we've got the periphery, where we can stimulate pain by using a hammer. <laughs> now, what's the difference between someone with chronic pain and acute pain? Firstly, the pain spreads and amplifies when it becomes chronic. And this was the topic of my PhD, to try and look at a model that explains why pain spreads and amplifies with time. And this creates confusion. And today I saw a patient who's had knee pain for around seven years. And he's had an MRI scan, he's had it all worked up, and there's pretty much nothing wrong with his knee. When I saw him today, I examined his hips, and his hips were very stiff and painful. And I'm suspecting that he has referred pain from the hip into the knee, and that may be causing the symptoms. So the confusion creates problems for people who suffer chronic pain. The other side of it, we have the comorbidities, insomnia, which leads to fatigue. We have anxiety, depression, difficulty coping at work, at home, and it really does create a downward spiral for people. The first thing we're going to look at today is the sympathetic nervous system and hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. This system was designed for the wild when we were cavemen. We saw the tiger, the stress chemicals went up. When we run, fight and sweat, they went down. Now, in the brain, there are in fact six or more neurotransmitters released. Serotonin, adrenaline, noradrenaline, corticotrophic releasing hormone, histamine, acetylcholine, in the spinal cord, serotonin, noradrenaline, and throughout the body, adrenaline, noradrenaline, and cortisol. Now what happens is the neurotransmitters in the brain attach to receptors. The receptors produce second messengers, such as cyclic AMP down on the bottom right-hand corner. And this then can open up ion channels, creating an action potential. So this can give us an explanation of a direct link between stress and pain. And when we look at the connections, in particular noradrenaline and serotonin, what we find as we look at the screen is that there are widespread connections in the brain, including the thalamus and sensory cortex. So once these neurotransmitters are released, there's a possibility they attach to receptors within the thalamus and sensory cortex, open up ion channels and increase action potentials, leading to a, a sensation of pain and amplifying pain. Now, if this happens in the sensory cortex, I like to explain it to patients that um, some of the other symptoms may in fact be similar. That if we excite the reticular formation with action potentials, we may have insomnia. If we excite the amygdala with action potentials, we may in fact have anxiety, panic attack, and the hypothalamus changes may explain some depression symptoms. So, this is one of the reasons why people with pain end up similar to people with chronic stress-related disorders. They have the similar spectrum of symptoms. And the comorbidity, it's about 300% increased risk of insomnia, anxiety, depression if you have chronic pain. And in fact, uh, I was reading a study yesterday that if you have depression, your risk of pain is also much greater. So one of the things that happens with chronic pain is amplification. And this happens mostly at the synapse. 
What happens at the synapse on the right hand side? We can see a blob of the synapse with neurotransmitter release. Now, one of the things that can happen is the amount of neurotransmitter release can increase when you have chronic pain. The other thing that happens is in the receptor plate, usually only 30% of, of neurotransmitter binds to the plate. This can increase to 80% when we have sensitization. Another thing that can happen is we have gene transcription and protein synthesis, and this can actually increase the number of synapses. So in stage one, we may have three synaptic connections, then you get the nerves growing, and then you might have six, and this will certainly reduce the threshold to the actual potential. Another part of the puzzle um, was migraine. Now, migraine is not just a headache, and Quite often when I'm at conferences, I'll ask people who has an aura without any headache pain. And generally speaking, at least a dozen people will put their hands up. So they're having a migraine symptom, but no headache. I like to describe migraine as the genetic predisposition to sensory amplification. People with migraine are in fact sensitive to light, sound, pain, touch, and smell. And when I ask migraine sufferers, they certainly tell me this, that their sense of smell is much stronger. The problem is in fact the channelopathy. And what this means is that the channels in the sensory cortex are different and they actually open up at lower thresholds, producing more action potentials. And when we look at the population studies, what we find is that the relative risk of chronic pain disorders is markedly increased for people with migraine. So for complex regional pain syndrome, the risk of complex regional pain syndrome for someone who has migraine is around three to four times as much as a person who doesn't have migraine. Fibromyalgia. If you have migraine with aura, your risk of fibromyalgia is 6.6 .6 times someone who doesn't have migraine with aura. Low back pain, the risk is around double. So here we've got a condition that amplifies pain. Now, interestingly, when someone does have an aura, I, I say to people, that's like a spontaneous discharge of electricity or action potentials in the sensory cortex. It's in fact exactly the same as an epileptic fit, except that the electricity is discharging on the motor cortex. And what actually happens when you look at the research is if you have migraine, your risk of epilepsy is four or five times and vice versa. So the two conditions are the same problem, but they're manifesting in slightly different parts of your brain. So this is not the total that explains the pain spectrum, the sympathetic tone and migraine, but it, it partly explains it. And if we look at people, one of the great mysteries that we have is sometimes you get people come into your room, uh, they've got worn out joints and they've got no pain. And then you get people with minor changes and lots of pain. And this has created a lot of problems when looking at musculoskeletal pain. On the left hand side, um, that's my scan for my back. And about four or five years ago, I was leg pressing 200 Ks, had a bit of back pain now and then, but really nothing much. The machine slipped and 200 Ks sort of squashed me a bit. And this created about two years of low back pain uh, where I was waking at 2 a.m some leg symptoms, and I finally did get an MRI scan done, and it shows some significant disc narrowing that's been there for many, many years, and that accident didn't create the disc narrowing, uh, although it activated the pain. Uh, and interestingly, I used to live in Seatoon in Wellington, and I'd be a kayaker, so whenever I kayaked, I'd actually get pins and needles down both legs. After around 10 minutes, I'd sort of lift myself off the seat, would go away and I'd sit back down and keep going and after 10 minutes it would come back and I wasn't any wiser to why it was happening. <laughs> However, once I got the scan done I could see that, oops, there might be a little bit of nerve root compression. Uh, I have pretty much zero pain now. Uh, I've done some treatment and uh, I looked at the problem and only if I'm moving house and lifting a lot of boxes I might get some discomfort but day to day it's zero. Now, on the right hand side, we've got someone who has migraine with aura. And she had a lot of back pain, um, seven, eight, nine out of 10. 
she has a disc in her lumbar sacral region which shows dehydration, uh, a little bit of an annular tear, uh, but it's a pretty good scan. And you know, we'd say, wow, that's a reasonably good looking back. Uh, but she did have mechanical pain where she bent over, when she was lifting, sitting for long periods. So it was consistent with a disc. In fact, she went on to have a fusion um, because she was so troubled and the fusion eliminated her pain. And it's a very drastic measure. However, um, it's interesting that two people can have different levels of pain despite the varied pathology. And it runs in families a little because my sister in fact came down, she's around 55, came down to Wellington with a bit of knee pain, uh, a little bit of a limp, but no distress. Her hip was in fact worn out bone on bone and she in fact went on to have a hip replacement. Um, so it probably does run the families. And what we've got to remember is that both ends of the spectrum aren't much fun. On one side, you're going to get a lot of pain all the time and that's annoying. <laughs> on the other side, you're not going to feel the pain as much, but when you end up 45, 50, maybe a little bit older, you may present with pain but you may have quite a lot of narrowing of discs and wearing out of your cartilage when you do present trouble. So both ends of the spectrum, um, a little bit annoying. Now, if we put this together for something like fibromyalgia, one of the mysterious illnesses of our time, it can be relatively easily explained if we think of it as two things. Now, a lot of people come into fibromyalgia either from chronic stress, uh, or sometimes from chronic unresolved pain. And so what we're getting is a sympathetic nervous system response, which is creating the insomnia and anxiety, depression and irritable bowel symptoms. So that's one part of it. The other part of it is pain that's in fact referring. And this is what happens with chronic pain, it spreads. And when I'm explaining this to patients, and we do need explanations for our patients because they need to know what's going on with me, doc. They, we can't just tell them, oh, we don't know. It's generally easier to give them an explanation that is simple, uh, but sort of close to the mark. And what I say to them, you've got a body map in your brain. Basically, when the electricity lights up your body map, you get pain. When you have lots of pain, or it's been there for a long time, the electricity might spread. And this is why you might get pain in different places. And if you get pain sort of throughout your body, sometimes we diagnose this as fibromyalgia. So what I basically tell people is that A, you've got a stress reaction giving you some of your symptoms, and B, uh, you've got some pain perhaps somewhere in your body which is spreading. Now I've treated many patients who have come and some of them have had, uh, many in particular have had necks, discs, which are giving them pain, and low back discs. And so they're getting spread in their sort of lower legs, in their arms. And once we look at the source of pain and also improve their sympathetic nervous system, they actually do really well. Now I just wanted to add in, I'm mainly talking about musculoskeletal pain, which is my passion. It's about biomechanics and biomechanical pain. It involves a lot of physics, which I've uh, learned a lot over the years around the physics of loading, impulse loading. And when we're talking musculoskeletal pain, we're talking about often there are loading patterns. And the simplest thing here is the knee. Uh, I might have knee pain. If I walk or run, it hurts. And if I'm sitting, I don't get much pain. We wouldn't really diagnose that. I mean, that strictly is a chronic pain syndrome after three months. But, you know, we'd probably diagnose that as musculoskeletal knee pain. And we might get some x-rays and scans, try and find out what's wrong. Um, so there's often changes on radiology, and as I've alluded to before, the changes can vary for different individuals. We're not all the same. Um, basically, the pain often increases on certain activities, and it responds usually to modified activity, sometimes treatment aimed at the source, um, sometimes injections, etc. And this is often dealt with in the community and sometimes the hospital if people aren't coping. Neuropathic pain is a, a different beast uh, and there's no biomechanical loading. Um, there's no changes really on radiology. Um, it's severe. Now if someone comes in and they go, look, 
my pain down my arm or down my leg is sort of six, seven, eight, I'll be immediately thinking of sort of nerve pain, probably nerve root pain in those situations. Uh, generally speaking, it's severe. It's not, they're not going to come to you with pain that's two or three out of ten, and it's unlikely to be neuropathic pain. Um, it doesn't respond to medications that well either, neuropathic pain. It's a very difficult one to treat. And I think generally speaking, this sort of pain has different mechanisms as well. Basically, nerves get damaged. There are changes um, in the dorsal horn, uh, in the dorsal ganglion, and in the brain. Probably a lot more changes occur. But these changes also occur with chronic musculoskeletal pain as well. But they're slightly different. And the hospital pain clinic would probably be at least, they need to have at least one or two appointments at a hospital pain clinic because they're up to play with the latest medicines uh, and combinations for neuropathic pain. And some community specialists are as well. And as discussed, my, my interest is simple self treatments for biomechanical uh, induced musculoskeletal pain. And that's what I do research on. So let's have a little look at management. Um, if we're going to manage pain, we're going to manage it at different levels. And it's a true biopsychosocial problem, and we must manage it this way. So firstly, if sympathetic nervous system tone is elevated, which it has been found in people with chronic pain syndromes, what about reducing sympathetic tone? And I like sending people to do their own treatment because it's cheap and usually affordable and they sh and it's probably something that they should have a habit for life um, so they keep well and this includes exercise and the exercise shouldn't hurt so the things I've put on the left hand side exercise sauna yoga tai chi and meditation all have shown to reduce sympathetic tone usually in eight to twelve weeks performed around three to four times a week and the evidence is clear for that and they've done heart rate variability studies and other studies which basically look at sympathetic tone over a period of time before and after intervention. And these are randomized studies with control groups as well. On the other side, we have psychological therapies. And this can teach us to cope with the pain. And, and it does actually teach us things like cognitive behavioral therapy, acceptance commitment therapy, even things like hypnosis relaxation therapies, they will reduce action potentials in your sensory cortex uh, and also reduce the feed from the sympathetic nervous system and stress chemicals. So that's where they come in. They're useful. We can also manage the pain at the source. So if someone has a hammer at your foot, <laughs> you can take the hammer away. And to this end, we could try uh, unloading the tissue. So if you have knee pain, you may want to, instead of run, you may want to cycle or use a stepper or cross trainer, perhaps swim. And this would allow you to remain fit, but it would also help reduce any extra pain you may create by loading the tissue. Gareesh, we just have a question that's come in about um, how do we convince people to take up things like exercise, um, self-management, how do we supervise them doing that? How do you approach this with your patients? Basically, uh, when a patient does come in to see me in my rooms, um, and if they've come for, say, their, any pain problem and they are obese uh, and in the 50 to 70 range, I will give them a spiel mm -hmm. <laughs> because I'm not really interested in what they're going to be like next week. Uh, my interest is long term. Yeah. And, and I often say to them, so if they're 50, basically, uh, and they're out of shape, I'll say, your risks of ending up in a nursing home are basically quite increased in 10, 20 years. In fact, uh, and the other thing I tell them is that, you know, they might gain a little bit more weight over the next 10, 20 years, and it's going to be very difficult to turn them around in bed. I, I do use shock tactics. <laughs> <laughs> Gently, but, but I, I do. The other things I say to people are that often people who uh, don't do one of those therapies to reduce sympathetic tone, if they've got insomnia, anxiety, depression, I say to them that, look, the research shows clearly that these interventions will actually help uh, those symptoms. 
and I've just finished a book on insomnia, anxiety, depression over the past two years, looking at research in this area. And the other things they help with are dementia. Um, they help with cancer. So if you exercise three times a week, your risk of cancer is about a third less. So there's, I think what we need to do is um, strike the chord with the patient that's most important to them. And when I speak to 50 to 60 year olds and who are out of shape, you know, I think the risks of dementia and cancer, uh, but also ending up in a nursing home. Uh, and the other thing I say to people is, look, we're living a lot longer. You know, we're, we're really living, you know, 80 is probably a reasonable age to expect for most people to live. And if they're 50, they've got 30 years to live. And do they want to end up uh, unable to drive, unable to cook? Um, or do they want to have the use of all their faculties um, till they basically die? And so I think um, it takes time. And I think, uh, I think in a general practice setting, when you may not have as much time, it's a little bit more difficult, but probably worthwhile perhaps introducing one thing at a time. And this thing about exercise, you know, I think we need to say to people who have a musculoskeletal pain that's aggravated by biomechanics that really the exercise shouldn't aggravate your pain because the last thing people want to do is you know do it walk a lot um, which may stimulate pain and then they'll stop walking because it hurts doctor and so they have a fear of continuing absolutely yeah. and they in fact may be wearing out a few tissues if they go too hard as well yeah okay thank you no worries the so at the source and Medications, which um, fascinating beast actually, and uh, I've um, recently been to a Cochrane reviewers course, uh, and it was uh, very interesting about um, clinical trials, <laughs> what's disclosed and what's not. <laughs> but um, from the slide, what we can see is that um, there's analgesics and there's pain modifying agents, and I think that's reasonably Good way to separate it and when I did my PhD I, I was rather fascinated but basically analgesics work by attaching to receptors and reducing action potentials and they generally do this mostly in the brain and very few work in the body and if they do work in the body it cites an inflammation, inflammation often they're higher doses so non steroidals work on prostaglandins opioids on new kappa receptors and others cannabinoids on cannabinoid receptors CB1 and 2 and when we look at the pain modifying agents um, we've got antidepressants that work on adrenergic acetylcholine serotonin which is the 5-hydroxy tryptamine 5-HD and dopamine we've got anti-epileptics they work on the sodium channel receptors calcium channel receptors they work on GABA and GABA basically attaches and it reduces electricity action potential. So some of these agents directly attach to a receptor and suppress action potentials. Uh, some of them block other neurotransmitters which increase action potentials. And this is quite a nice way of looking at it. I, I found it very useful for myself um, five, six years ago when I looked at medications. Antipsychotics, they work on serotonin, dopamine, uh, and then there's gabapentin, pregabalin, and in fact, they were designed to work on the GABA receptors, but they don't. <laughs> Interestingly, we don't quite know where they work. But um, and I'm going to look at amitriptyline for a little, because amitriptyline has the best evidence, uh, pretty much, of all our pain-modifying agents. And I've got a little theory on this, and I suspect it's because it's a dirty drug. <laughs> and what I mean, it acts on multiple receptors. So it acts on adrenergic receptors, acetylcholine receptors, serotonin receptors, histamine receptors. And these all sound very familiar from the neurotransmitters released in the brain from the stress response, don't they? And they also inhibit sodium channels, calcium channels, and potassium channels. So they've got a very wide range of action. And we've got another question. Yes, we had a question about duloxetine. 
um, that there is some evidence to support its effectiveness for the types of neuro, some types of neuropathic pain. Um, it is not funded in New Zealand, um, being the vaccine is, but the evidence for its effectiveness in neuropathic pain is less. Now, I've just been um, reading some papers on this, and further to my hypothesis that possibly the more receptors you hit, the greater the effect. And in particular, I think the noradrenaline and the serotonin receptors are probably the big two. They're probably the ones that are, uh, I think, implicated the most in the spinal cord and brain. So drugs that hit both of those receptors are likely to work better than one that just hits one of those receptors. So let's look at fluoxetine, which is an SRI, a serotonin reuptake inhibitor. That doesn't really work, not for chronic headache, not for chronic pain. But duloxetine and venlafaxine are both SNRIs, so they're serotonin and noradrenaline reuptake inhibitors. And in fact, the evidence shows that they do work for some chronic pain syndromes, and they work around the same. So I think uh, in the absence of duloxetine funded here, venlafaxine does have some evidence um, for chronic pain syndromes. However, it's probably just not the same number of trials, but there are some large trials uh, and systematic reviews as well. So I think in New Zealand, if I was looking at a um, antidepressant other than say amitriptyline, nortriptyline, uh, I would probably go to something more like venlafaxine to give it a trial. Now, we're not just dealing with research here either, because yes, we can go to randomized control trials and say, hey, look, the number needed to treat amitriptyline is three. So you need three people and one will respond. We're talking about individuals. And when we're talking about individuals, what we'll find is that sometimes we'll give someone 10 milligrams of amitriptyline, absolute gold. They're sleeping, their pain's a lot less, they're functioning, and it just happens to work for them. In other patients, that will be giving them lots of side effects. Now, when I think about amitriptyline and side effects, we're, we're actually talking about the effects of the medication. We're not actually, it's just that they're unwanted. But if we looked at amitriptyline, looked at all the receptors that it's going to hit, we can predict exactly what symptoms people are going to get. Some of them are going to be symptoms you want, such as sleepiness, uh, some reduced pain, um, perhaps some reduced depression, uh, and stress-related symptoms at higher doses. Uh, and then the other ones like dry mouth, sometimes postural hypotension, they are explained. And also the symptoms in the heart are explained by some of the sodium channels, which are not, so the amitriptyline doesn't just hit the sodium channels in our sensory pathways. Uh, we have sodium channels in our cardiovascular system. <laughs> so, Suresh, how do you approach people who really dislike those side effects and want to stop medication despite it helping or being effective for their pain? I, I think the, so there's a few sort of principles. One is that I would make sure that you take some score, maybe a pain score, and when you're talking zero to 10, and I often you know, I have a pain chart, but zero is no pain, five is moderate, 10 is stabbed by a knife. And I'll take a pain score. And then I may prescribe something at very low dose, increasing very slowly. And I think go slow initially is, is the way to go. Because if we go too quickly, they get side effects. We may be missing out on an extremely useful drug. And, and, that's, and, and I think although I'm not a big... Uh, pharmaceutical prescriber, we need to use all the tools in the toolbox because we have a lot of complex patients and you know one dose of amitriptyline at 10 milligrams may be enough for them while they perhaps start doing other things to help their symptoms. So go slow, uh, start with very low doses, explain some of the effects of the medicine, probably try and explain it that hey look they're not really side effects but it just hits a lot of receptors. I think the other thing is if we explain that there's lots of receptors in our brain, uh, basically um, increased electricity will increase pain, and these medications can reduce electricity to help our pain, may give some sort of explanation. And I think one of the problems we have is people go and they, they go to their pharmacy and they say, do you know that's an antidepressant? <laughs> or do you know that's an antipsychotic? Mm -hmm. And they freak out a little bit. And I think, so we need to be quite clear that there's, sort of three or four types of medicines 
that will reduce electricity in the brain. And there's probably, I don't know, I haven't counted, there must be 20 or 30 varieties. And sometimes I've used quetiapine, a small dose of 25 milligrams. Sometimes I've used, you know, gabapentin or pregabalin. Sometimes I've tried um, tegretol. So I think we we shouldn't sort of say, and all these medicines have relatively similar efficacy um, as the neuro agents. Lots of people use nortriptyline as an alternative. What's your approach with it? And nortriptyline is quite good to use. Amitriptyline, in fact, metabolizes to nortriptyline. Mm. So, so basically, and I think nortriptyline has less side effects mm. often. Um, so I think it's just a case of trial and error. If they don't like amitriptyline, try nortriptyline. Um, there's a question here that talks about pregabalin funding being out for consultation at the moment. Is there an appreciable difference between gabapentin and pregabalin? Not particularly. I think uh, I was looking at uh, a trial and the numbers needed to treat for fibromyalgia around 7 to 14 for pregabalin. So it's not much better than duloxetine and probably won't be much better than venlafaxine either. So I think uh, at the end of the day, uh, there are probably plenty of options to trial. Um, um, there was uh, also a question about the weight gain that you can get with amitriptyline and how, how you approach this or whether there is an effective approach to that. <laughs> Look, uh, there certainly is some weight gain, I think, uh, that's been shown. I think probably it's the balance and, and I think if someone is uh, exercising regularly uh, and um, hopefully the weight gain will be less and I think the other thing I like to say to people look uh, while we get you say to the sauna 20 minutes three times a week because that will also reduce uh, this neurotransmitter soup in the brain you know while we get you um, to start exercising in the swimming pool perhaps doing some aqua jogging if it's too painful to run uh, perhaps doing some cycling. So, you know, I think medication should be used to kickstart people to try and do something that they can do which doesn't cause pain. And maybe the trial should be six to 12 weeks. Um, and, you know, if it's really useful, sure, they can continue it. But I think our aim is to try and get them to do something natural, uh, regularly, that should help some symptoms. And so they can then come off it again. There was a couple of questions here about physiotherapy um, and the use of that in terms of um, treating musculoskeletal pain rather than the neuropathic pain and also how you approach exercise um, specifically asked about cervical spine where there could be areas of hyper or hypo mobility and that exercise may aggravate those joints. Sure. Um, I think um, we've got a case of the neck which we'll be talking about. I think uh, I work um, in Wellington at the Sports and Pain Clinic, and we've got uh, three physios, um, a couple of acupuncturists, nurses, another doctor. So it's very multidisciplinary, and I think um, multidisciplinary is the way to go. Uh, and I think when we're treating people with musculoskeletal pain, they may have some disc pain, but then they get muscle pain too. Then they get biomechanics, which change, so they get muscle shortening. Uh, and this can, in fact, um, make joint pain worse. So we do need to treat um, pretty much their muscles. We need to treat their biomechanics. Uh, we need to give them stretches and strengthening at some point along the track. And this needs to be done uh, with physios, osteopaths, uh, sometimes chiropractors do that as well, uh, and, and other health providers, because we're not really going to have the time to advise our patients on exactly how to do things. Mm -hmm. And I think my role as a specialist is probably more to find out the source of pain, uh, find out biomechanical factors, muscles, and try and give a prescription uh, to other health providers who can follow that, and then review the patient in another six, eight weeks to see how they're going. Um, so physiotherapy, uh, osteopathy, the other disciplines are integral in helping patients. Uh, and on our pain scale, if someone has uh, 0 to 10, a change of 1 to 2 out of 10 is, or 30% reduction is the um, level at which a patient will go, I feel much better. So patients often will go to their physiotherapist, they're in a lot of pain, uh, and they'll make them better by two or three 
uh, or any other practitioner for that matter. And so patients will uh, thank the practitioner and believe them and go back to them next time as well mm -hmm. because uh, it's helped them and that's what patients want. So I think uh, we need to remember this, that it's a collaborative approach um, with pharmaceuticals, uh, health providers, um, including those that treat the muscle and joints. Shall we move on to the cases now? Sure. So the last thing I want oh, yeah. to say is that with the um, with these tablets, pain modifying agents in particular, we need to sort of try one, see what happens. If they get side effects uh, or they don't get the response, try another. And and I think you know you could have a plan that you know there's a, there's a dozen at least. Um, and I think if the patient's keen on some assistance, uh, that's the way to go. And, and you may find one that suits the patient. And I think that's the way to use these medicines. A bit of trial and error. Okay. All right. So, the case one, first of all. So the first case is 74 year old, uh, former male, uh, former construction worker. He's a male and he's had multiple visits over 12 months to his general practitioner. Uh, he's seen physiotherapists and over the years he's seen several people as people do and I think this is normal um, and normally with back pain we're talking episodes we're talking people actually get uh, three four five episodes a year especially someone who would be a construction worker um, and basically um, he had an MRI scan when he came along and this shows some changes and what we see there is um, if we look and I'm going to use the pointer here so if we look at this level here, that's a normal disc. Um, we can see hydration within the disc. Uh, we see the annulus at the edges, um, and it's of normal height. Now, as we go down the scan, uh, we see discs that are a bit darker and a bit narrower. And particularly here, we see discs that are sticking out. Uh, and we also see changes here at the vertebral end plate. So one of the things that happens when you get narrow discs. I consider discs to be washes, basically water washes. And I say this to patients that we have water washes throughout our body. We have them in our knees, we have them in our spine. And these water washes absorb pressure because bones don't like pressure. And once bones have pressure, uh, they basically generate action potentials and can be a source of nociception if they're loaded significantly. And at the same time, they don't have to cause any pain at all as well. Um, but that's the way I like to explain it. And this patient was getting symptoms down the leg uh, and in the lumbar spine. And so what I did with this patient um, was basically uh, we talked about some medicines. Um, we talked about amitriptyline to start with. He's a bit older, probably a little more prone to side effects, but uh, it's hard to know in a small dose may help him sleep. He was having some trouble sleeping, especially when he was rolling over and sleeping on his side. Um, and the other thing I did was uh, advise the person to trial some traction as well. Now, the traction is a funny thing in that um, there are six randomized control trials which have been performed, two in the last two or three years. And these have shown 60% average reduction in pain. Uh, in one trial in 2012, uh, showed a 76% rate reduction of discectomy in people with disc prolapse who are waiting a discectomy. So I've been using traction for the last four or five years at least, and currently I'm doing uh, a large randomized controlled trial on traction for low back pain. Um, and the good thing about traction is that it's cheap and it's easy to do. You can sort of lie on your front over a Swiss ball, bend your knees at the back, and basically your legs and your trunk at the front are pulling your back apart. Uh, you can use an inversion machine, and this only needs to be used at 30 to 45 degrees uh, for two to three, five minutes, once or twice a day. So this patient went out and bought an inversion machine, and this was six months ago. I saw him again recently. He's basically had no exacerbations in the last six months, and his leg symptoms have diminished, and he's doing reasonably well. And it's not to say he won't have another exacerbation in the future, but uh, once he's bought the machine, he basically has no ongoing costs. Um, so that's how I managed this patient. And in the end, he went off the medicines that he was given, 
um, and didn't need them. Uh, and that's uh, and I also advise them to exercise regularly, uh, maybe in the swimming pool. For this patient, I wouldn't advise them to cycle uh, because sitting loads your spine and sitting for a long period of time uh, will load your spine significantly and often causes pain. And that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about biomechanical loading of tissues. Um, so patients, he was having trouble bending. So if he, he was having a day in the garden, he'd have some pain at the end of it. Uh, being a former construction worker, he was always doing a little bit of DIY and uh, lifting jib and other things would aggravate his pain. So I'd also advise him, you know, I think I probably wouldn't load the spine. Um, I'd piecemeal load it. So what I often tell people is lift one piece of jib at a time. Don't lift five pieces at a time. Uh, and, and things like that as well to try and help them. With the traction um, with this gentleman, he, he bought a machine. Is there a, a way of being able to do traction without having a machine for yourself? Can you go out in the community and do that? At the moment, um, one of my aims, and I started the New Zealand Pain Foundation, which is a research charity. I do have an aim over the next sort of five years to try and put machines in gyms perhaps. Uh, to try and maybe put them in general practices and physio rooms um, so that basically people can trial it. And, and really, the way I test it is I get people to jump on uh, and if they say, oh, my pain's a little bit better, you know, might have gone from five to three, I'll say, well, look, this is probably going to help. Yeah. And that, that's the very simple way of testing it. Well, Do you have to warn people about any possible risks related to traction? The risks are few. Uh, there have been some studies showing that your blood pressure will increase around 10 millimetres of mercury. It doesn't skyrocket. There are some risks uh, around the eyes if they've got um, high pressure in your eyes, a glaucoma. So there are certain contraindications, but not too many. And a study compared 30 degrees with 45 degrees and found in 30 and 60 degrees, sorry, and they found not much difference. So you can do it at 30 degrees. You don't have to be upside down at all. And in fact, that's not what I recommend. Okay. And one more question here, sorry, Gersh, was about um, checking for cardiovascular disease and um, calcium phosphate and other blood markers. Do you do things like that in your clinic or do you um, refer that back to the general practitioner while you're also managing I, these people? Sure. We're probably talking about a slightly different thing here. I think with calcium phosphate, we're probably more talking about the bones themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I generally don't. Um, but uh, certainly if um, the scans come back with osteoporosis, I'll send them back to the general practitioner. And that can be managed by the general practitioner. Perhaps an endocrinologist mm -hmm. may step in as well if required. Okay, thank you. Okay. Now, psychological treatments. Um, also, the person was coping reasonably fine. He wasn't uh, too distressed. He wasn't um, having any depression and he was coping with his life. So in that situation, he didn't really need to see a psychologist or have other treatments. Now, in this arena, um, my favorite is in fact mindfulness. <laughs> and the reason I say that is um, it's, it's available in the community. There are a lot of courses, one hour a week for 12 weeks, hundred odd dollars, so it's quite affordable, ten dollars a time, uh, and it does teach you um, to be in the moment, uh, not to worry about the past or the future, and so I think, you know, that's quite a handy sort of treatment. Also, there's programs, that are, well, web-based sort of um, programs, as well as phone-based apps on mindfulness, as well as on CBT, and some of the studies have actually shown that um, CBT on your phone on an app has been similar in efficacy to sometimes seeing a therapist. So there is some new research coming out which hopefully will make these treatments a lot more accessible to the masses. How do you explain to a gentleman like this? Or do you have a conversation with them along the lines of, you, you know, this is a, a chronic pain problem for you? It's, it's quite a sensitive topic to bring up with someone who might be thinking you're yes. telling them it's all in their head. Um, how do you go about this? I think um, I, I like to explain it that pain produces a stress response. Yeah. And with the stress response, you won't generally be a happy camper. And what I find is uh, people, when they have chronic pain, they 
they won't have a smile on their face all the time. They'll sort of be more like this, down in the dumps a little bit. They may not see it, but in fact, sometimes when people's pain has subsided, um, they come back and they go, oh, the pain's a lot better. And they notice people around them saying, that, hey, have you been on holiday? <laughs> so there's an appreciable change in your face. Uh, this thing about face-to-face -face communication, <laughs> which I think is all important, and you pick up on people's faces, you know, are they looking down? Are they looking a little bit sad when they talk about their lives? Are they a little bit lost? So we need to pick up on these cues. And I think we need to specifically ask as well. We need to say, hey, look, how are you sleeping? How many sort of panic attacks, anxiety? Um, how's your mood? You know, you're still going to the, uh, and if you know the patient well, it's, and I think this is one of the beauties of general practice, and I was a general practitioner for 10 years, you know people, you get to know them a little bit, you know what they enjoy doing, their hobbies, and you know, and, and as long as long as you've listened, yeah. <laughs> you'll be able to ask them, hey, we're still going um, to play bridge. Uh, you're still going to- Building that rapport with them, aren't you? Absolutely, yeah. I think um, in, in terms of the mood of the patient, I think there's probably no better person than a general practitioner mm -hmm. to pick up on those non-verbal cues. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think uh, even when they're in chronic pain and they've probably gone to perhaps a physio, perhaps a pain specialist, but then you know, often uh, the general practitioner will be involved in their care. And when they come in, it's, um, it's pretty useful because it, you know, we are not just managing pain mm -hmm. and chronic pain. Let's, mm -hmm. let's dispel that. We are dealing with a person we're dealing with their families, their partners, uh, and, and if we don't step in and manage the insomnia, anxiety, depression, irritability, irritability is huge. And I, I haven't mentioned it today, but uh, that's sort of the fourth one off the rank that I always ask people, how is the insomnia, anxiety, depression, and irritability? <laughs> but often it's a question for their partners. And for myself, I, I, I really, um, you know, I like to see patients and their significant others because patients sometimes downplay things. They may not be, men particularly, probably aren't that willing to come forward with um, the psychosocial issues. Mm. Um, back to some of the treatments which have been mentioned in the questions here, um, things like permidrolate infusions. Are you sort of aware of the effectiveness of these and... and as far as I'm aware, permidronate has some effect in complex regional pain syndrome, which we've got a case. Um, I'm unaware of any randomized control trials for permidronate uh, for low back pain, uh, and that's possibly because I haven't looked for them. <laughs> it's, uh, it's sort of, as I said earlier, my interest is in simple self treatments in the community for musculoskeletal pain. Um, and I'm not a hospital-based specialist, so I, I've, I've never given a permanent infusion. Uh, and I've read some literature on it, but not for low back pain. Sure. The ever-present opioid. <laughs> How do we go about considering opioids in a low back pain patient, which is a common problem in primary care? It certainly is. Yeah. And I think we've got real issues in that. Um, I think one of the things... I like to consider a toolbox. You know, we've got a toolbox uh, for patients, and it's a bit like asthma, where you know, self-care, they've got a little toolbox. Um, and so what I like to do is, I think patients uh, generally should take analgesia when their pain is severe. And people's pain goes up and down. This is a fact. Uh, and when they're having exacerbations, that's probably the time to pile on the analgesia, perhaps start with a non steroidal um, then add an, uh, an opioid, perhaps codeine, tramadol, and something more if you need it. But for a short burst, until they're sort of back to their non-exacerbation. Uh, I don't favour taking most pharmaceuticals regularly in terms of the analgesics, because let's face it, if we take the non steroidals over a long period of time, we're going to run into troubles with our kidneys and perhaps um, gastric, uh, gastric upset. Um, same thing with opioids, we're going to get into addiction, we're going to get into tolerance. So they're just going to need more and more uh, as time goes. Um, and there's been a whole lot of uh, basically uh, media coverage about uh, deaths and opioids. So I think they've become a big issue, uh, especially in Australia and America. Luckily here, uh, we're a little bit adverse to 
prescribing opioids, but I do think there's a role for having um, analgesia, including opioids, for exacerbations of pain. Mm -hmm. And perhaps while you may start a pain modifying uh, tablet as well. Thank you. Shall we move on to the next hack here? Mm -hmm. Now, case number two, um, luckily a little bit more simple. The young patients, <laughs> they often have a little bit less um, pathology in terms of narrowing of discs and changes, fortunately. And so this was a young female I saw recently who had neck pain. And she'd had neck pain for about a year, year and a half. Uh, had been seen uh, by um, lots of people. Mm -hmm. uh, as you do, once you have pain, you certainly chase providers um, who are recommended to you or otherwise, um, because you want to get rid of it. It really annoys you. <laughs> um, disturbed her sleep, um, created some difficulties at work. Um, she was working on a computer. And by the end of the day, her neck pain, um, she had a bit of arm pain, pain down the back of the shoulder. It was significantly worse. Now, I'm going to change tack a little bit here, <laughs> uh, have a little bit of fun. Uh, this x-ray was reported as normal. Um, I basically uh, will never see a patient without citing the radiology and showing the patient the radiology. And lately I've got into a habit of placing that radiology picture into the letter because it sort of gives the patients a reminder if it shows anything at all. Now, I'd like to ask the audience, um, and you're typing away your questions, um, the first three people who answer correctly are going to receive uh, a little gift sent out to them. Um, and these are a couple of books which I've written over the past four years after my PhD, one on back pain, one on neck pain, headache, migraine. Um, and if you answer me, what is wrong with that x-ray? Um, you will win a set of books. Three people are going to win a set of books which we'll post out to you. So I'm going to leave this case for a second and go on to the next case, and we'll come back to it. So the third case is an ankle sprain. And it was a 50-year-old female who was running on a track. Um, she had her foot caught in a foothold uh, and had a bit of a fall, actually. So it was a reasonably significant ankle sprain. Um, I was seeing her six months later, and she hadn't returned to work even. Um, this is how bad it was. She'd also had sort of reluctance to weight bear uh, and she'd had discoloration. The pain was going up her leg and her knee was getting a bit sore, also getting a little bit cold as well. Um, and people were getting pretty concerned, um, including the ACC, uh, as well as her workplace uh, and when she coming back to work, as well as herself <laughs> and her partner. Um, and obviously her limitations at home were quite significant now. Now, an MRI scan was performed before she came to see me, and this showed that she'd actually torn uh, her medial, her lateral ligaments. Uh, these were now healing, and they healed by scarring and uh, and she'd also had some bony contusions, um, which are on the MRI scan. Uh, and basically, I'll try and point to them. So, um, when we're looking at an MRI scan, what we're looking at is a homogeneous colour. So, we're looking at water content. And so, here, that's all one colour, it's sort of a dark grey. And here, you can see that this and this, uh, there's a bit of light coloration. And this represents fluid. And so, there's what we call edema in the bone. And so what's happened is these bones have basically hit each other and created a bit of bony bruising. We don't see this on x-ray, but we certainly do see this on the MRI scan. So firstly, um, she's had a reasonable amount of trauma, but now she's amplifying her pain as well. So um, she was a migraine patient with aura, and what we're seeing now is she's developing a complex regional pain syndrome. Mm. And this is uh, a concern. I mean, this patient needs to see a pain specialist and possibly be referred to the hospital, uh, pain clinic, or pretty much ASAP. Because the sooner we deal with this patient, um, the more likely she will improve. And that, that's for sure. Now, the research does show, however, that 40% of people will have trouble weight-bearing um, 
after a six to 18 months with an ankle sprain. So the time frame is not out of keeping with it. And in fact, this patient was just getting over her, her worst and she was around 60% better than she was when she sprained her ankle. So I think this is the other thing we need to ask. You know, are you any better than the day you sprain your ankle? And so she was able to wait there a little bit more. Um, she had started going to the swimming pool uh, two to three times a week, which was handy. Uh, and in the swimming pool, she was doing some aqua jogging. Um, and another thing people can do, which I often recommend, is just walking in the water to waist height up and down the swimming pool, uh, because then they're sort of relatively weightless. And that's a very useful uh, thing. And the thing about walking in the water is the resistance will increase your heart rate and get you somewhere to an exercise level rather than um, she, there's no way that she's going to be able to walk on the land for exercise and it's going to hurt so she's not going to be keen to do that. Um, I think uh, in this situation things like palidronate uh, may be useful. Um, sometimes uh, obviously medications are going to be useful and to go through the list of medicines is, is going to be helpful. Um, the other thing for this patient, uh, in some patients I've tried nerve blocks, especially if they're early on, to try and desensitize and I've found this useful. In fact, probably 10, maybe 8 years ago I did a case series of around only 10 patients, but I did nerve blocks, gave them Tegretol and a combination of things. And around, I believe, eight of them did reasonably well. So there is certainly concern for this patient. Uh, and it's not really that she should go back to full weight bearing, uh, but we need to modify her pain reaction. Uh, and we need to advise that this patient was 60% better. So I said, hey, look, this is actually OK. We're going in the right direction. And I think that was really important. I think in some situations, if she had a sitting job, um, you know, even getting some crutches so she can go to work, sit down at work, uh, we do need to think around the square of how this person can do their job. Uh, because going to work is very useful for people. It basically, it's good for the mind and good for the spirit. Uh, the camaraderie, seeing people at work is very useful. The patient unfortunately had a job where she had to walk around on the factory floor and uh, stand observing people. So she certainly couldn't do that. And I think, uh, and, and although this may sound a little radical, uh, even if the patient could use some sort of wheelchair or crutches just to visit the factory, um, in her factory visits and then go back to her desk and work, this is a solution that's a bit alternative. And I know people wouldn't encourage this because it may create more disability. But on the other hand, it may allow the patient to get back to work and start functioning normally as well. So. Um, and patients like this, there, there's been a question about the effectiveness of vitamin C use for patients like this. Do you know anything about that or do you use that in your practice? Mm -hmm. There's no randomized control trials I know of looking at vitamin C being effective for complex regional pain syndrome. There's only, a, yeah. yeah. And clonidine patches, that's another thing that people um, Now, in someone with complex regional pain syndrome, there are some of these patients who are sympathetically mediated. And so basically the nerves can sprout in the uh, adrenergic receptors and this can actually amplify pain. Plus, they may be getting a sympathetic response in their brain. In fact, they almost certainly are. So I think, um, like most things, trial and clonidine would be a worthwhile effort. Mm. And basically, if it works, maybe continue it while we try other things. Mm. Uh, and then maybe, hopefully, in six months, we can take them off some of the medicines when she's healed a bit more. With patients with chronic regional pain syndrome, um, there seems to be a lot of importance placed on the psychological input. Do you refer people to counselling or do you, yeah, how do you approach them? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, in this situation, um, we've got a person with an abnormal, um, well, let's not say abnormal, let's say a heightened pain response, which would be normal for that person. So we must remember that if you have 
migraine with aura and you have a bad sprain, um, bony contusions, a couple of torn tendons, you're not going to do that well in the short term. And it may take even 12 months um, to heal. And that's not out of keeping with ankle sprains. Mm. So I think it's all individual based. We have to think about the person, uh, the mechanism of injury, and what, you know, like this isn't, we would see people with this type of scan at six months while walking without any pain at all. That's fine. But it comes back to um, individuals and pathology. Some people have lots of pathology and they don't experience pain. Others have um, lesser pathology but more pain experience. In this situation, she definitely will need um, some psychological input. And because she won't be coping. She'll be having problems at home. Uh, she'll be having insomnia, probably a bit of anxiety, maybe depression set in. And these things need to be treated because these things will make her life a misery. Well, that's also been brought up here. How, um, you know, for all these the self-management apps and mindfulness and things like that. In this case, often there is that increased risk of suicide, suicidality. Let, like let me say, I, what I'm trying to get at is in your patient that comes in not too distressed, uh, that's still working, uh, <coughs> reasonably supportive home life and coping with their symptoms, that's when, you know, mindfulness, uh, apps on the phone, yeah. uh, that's where they're okay. I think once you get into this type of pain where it's potentially going to ruin someone's life, uh, especially if they develop insomnia, anxiety, depression, irritability, their relationship will be ruined, their job, you know, so there's a lot at stake and in this situation it's not really you're not going to tell her get a mindfulness app go off a mindfulness course i think in this situation you're going to refer her early uh, and that's why i said this patient needs to be seen perhaps at the hospital pain clinic perhaps in a multidisciplinary team and this is the uh, trend that's occurring in chronic pain management and that's great so if she can be seen in a team uh, with a psychologist uh, or someone else who deals with the psychology of the pain, uh, then this is absolutely uh, the time to refer early, not late. And I think, I think you know, this patient could be referred at even a month. And if a month out, she's really having trouble weight bearing, going back to activity, I think right then and there, uh, we need to start the referral process possibly because uh, because of the severity. So you know, nothing's hard and fast with these recommendations. They, they have to be individual mm. for individual people, uh, and that's for sure. And you know, if this person's had depression before, um, you know, then we've got to be even more careful because once you've had depression, the risk of having it again has uh, has actually increased. In fact, the research shows if you've had one episode of major depression, you're going to have nine within your lifetime. And every time you have an episode, it's easy to get another episode. So if this is one of your patients that, ha that has had a past history of insomnia, anxiety, depression, and now has a chronic pain problem, I think our threshold for referring has to be lower. It's that multidisciplinary approach. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Use the medicines, um, use the people, the psychologists, the physios to help. Uh, you know, the walking aids, the occupational therapist as well. Obviously, I haven't mentioned that, but certainly that's another part um, of, the, of the pain pitch. Absolutely. We need to, we need to all be uh, helping this type of patient. It's not uh, like you can have one injection for this patient or one tablet and there's going to be a miracle. There are no miracles. And in terms of medications for a patient like this, it's a... It's a a big melting pot of how to work out and individualise what you give to people. Yeah. Uh, opioids, again, are brought up That's for right. patients like this. So. I think um, the same as the general advice. There are a few medicines that have been proven to work with complex regional pain syndrome more than others. However, uh, we must remember that we can't always rely on the research. Um, we can and we can't because this is not a very common problem. Yeah. So we're not going to have large... Um, you know, trials of two or three hundred people, and uh, we're not li likely to have systematic reviews uh, with multiple uh, tr um, class one evidence feeding this. Mm. And that's the problem. Mm. So there may be, I you know, there may be things that work, but they haven't been trialled fully. Mm. 
Yes, is a question about a lanzapine in particular. Is that something you've ever used, or is it not? I personally one? haven't used the lanzapine. However, as I said, I've used quetiapine, and I probably wouldn't hesitate to use lanzapine mm -hmm. um, because some people may respond to it if they haven't responded to other things. And so it obviously wouldn't be my first line because I haven't any experience using it. But, you know, there, there may be other people who have experience using that medicine. So I think mm -hmm. as doctors, we're probably creatures of habit a little bit mm -hmm. that we do reach for yeah. the ones we're familiar with. Yeah. And sometimes new drugs do come out and we obviously integrate them into our practice. Um, but, you know, often... Hopefully, we don't have to go to the 12th medication. Do you find list. it difficult to convince people to give a proper trial to each medication? Is it, is it difficult to get them to continue through some side effects that may wane over time or that they may accept yes. over time? I think that will depend on the side effect. Yeah. Um, and I think if the you know side effect is morning drowsiness um, and they don't need to be alert because they yeah, not too much, then perhaps you could give it a trial for a week or two. Mm. Uh, and and I think it will depend on the effectiveness. If they've had a lot of reduction in their pain mm. and they're sleeping a bit better, they may put up with it for a week and then hopefully in a week's time we can review them and say, how oh, how's that morning drowsiness? Have you got a little bit better? Because people do often get used to some side effects. Mm. And I think uh, in a recent podcast I gave the cannabinoids, uh, which is on the Goodfellow website, um, what they found with cannabinoids is that if you are regular, uh, if you take them regularly, you don't get the side effects as often. Mm -hmm. And if you took them intermittently, you're more likely uh, to have side effects. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, hopefully tolerance will develop for the side effects. Mm -hmm. Can you comment at all on the access to some of the multidisciplinary um, therapy that these patients need? Uh, there are areas of New Zealand that don't have pain clinics mm. or specific pain um, yes. referral <laughs> processes. So, is there, yeah, I think I think we've got a, a problem, and uh, especially possibly in the smaller centres. Uh, and one of the problems really is the logistics of travel. Um, Patients may not be financially able to travel to bigger centres. That is a problem. ACC do fund people to travel. Uh, fortunately, um, when they've got an ACC covered injury, um, but if they haven't got an ACC covered injury, that can be an issue. Uh, and I think um, the availability of a multi, true multidisciplinary approach um, is less. But I think there is becoming sort of more suburban centres mm. and outreach clinics and, and sort of national providers mm. uh, which are providing multidisciplinary services. Mm. Um, so I think um, it's probably no different to cardiovascular disease, strokes mm. and, and other uh, illnesses in that uh, we have this disparity sometimes between countryside and cities. One more comment on this particular case, um, which is related to the lifestyle factors that you often find, or you may find in these patients, I should say, um, alcohol-based, smoking, other lifestyle things that impact on their recovery or their ability to manage their life. Do you try and address those over time, or do you address them at the beginning of seeing these patients? I think um, it's very important uh, because people will reach for the alcohol. They think it'll help them sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think at some point it needs to be broached. And I think uh, in the psychos in the multidisciplinary approach, it certainly can be approached because often there's two to three assessments mm -hmm. performed over three hours. So this helps get to the nitty gritty uh, of how much they're taking. Uh, I think um, simply smoking increases sympathetic tone. And that's a fact uh, borne out in the studies. So it will aggravate insomnia, anxiety, depression, and increased pain. So I think quite simply, the evidence shows that, in fact, one glass of wine around 150 mils will not increase sympathetic tone, but two to three glasses definitely increases sympathetic tone. And while we're on this, um, that's why we get the hangover. So basically, uh, if we drink in excess, which most of us have experienced, <laughs> The sympathetic nervous system overnight is releasing the neurotransmitters in the brain, producing action potentials, and in the morning, 
you're awake or the raging headache. And so, in fact, um, the alcohol increases sympathetic tone. So I think if patients are self-medicating with alcohol, I think we need to tell them, hey, alcohol will actually have the opposite effect. Mm -hmm. It will give you a poor night's sleep and will amplify your pain. Mm -hmm. And in fact, smoking is, does exactly the same thing. That also increases sympathetic tone, mm -hmm. although it'll be a very hard one to give up because uh, obviously the addictive uh, potential of cigarettes. Mm -hmm. Now back to our case number two. We have our um, okay. three responses, Karen, Sue and Rona, who I think have come correctly, but you tell us about this. Absolutely. So you guys have nailed it uh, in the comments. Basically, the neck is straight, but in fact, if you look at it, it's actually got a little reverse curve. It's a subtle, but almost definite. And that reverse curve occurs, is about centered about here. And so, Normally, the cervical spine has a lordosis, which is a curve in the other direction. And this lordosis acts like a C-shaped spring, right? So your head's here, and basically the pressure's relieved in the middle of this, the spring. Now, if we straighten this, the pressure goes straight to the bottom, and this pressure can create disc prolapse and pain. And if we reverse curve it, it actually increases the pressure significantly more. So with this patient, uh, and as I stated before, I do like simple self-treatments. Um, and Helen is going to kindly <laughs> model the traction collar. This is a very simple device uh, available for under 20 or 30 dollars. And basically you pump it up and it takes your net head off your neck. So it reduces the pressure. This is my go-to for neck pain. And this patient had had a year and a half of neck pain. Uh, I advise her to use a collar uh, five to 10 minutes, two or three times a day. Now, the next thing I advised was that her posture, she's been looking down at her phone and she's been looking at her laptop and looking down. And this basically, uh, what I tell patients is that the spine will take the shape you give it. It's like plasticine. And this can be reversed, however. And another little thing I give them is advise them to use a pump water bottle full of water, place it behind their neck and lay on the ground on the carpet for around five to ten minutes, once a day minimum. It'll take three to six months to restore the lordosis, as well as to use good posture. And this means cell phone in front of your face, books, reading, laptops on a box with a keyboard mouse extension. Um, I think unfortunately we have an environment in which we are seeing a rapid rise in neck pain, which is almost outshadowing back pain now. And you know, we've got a lot of problems. Now I'm glad I'm speaking to a, a reasonably large audience. Laptops in schools. Um, we need to address these issues at a government level. Um, to hopefully uh, change some of the furniture that's, that is available at schools and change some of the habits. Otherwise, we are leading into a, a large epidemic of neck pain and referred pain into head headaches as well. So this young lady, after about six weeks, came back, had travelled overseas to uh, Vietnam and had no pain. She was much better. And this is the beauty of a young patient. They're not going to have too many um, chronic disc problems. Uh, and relieving some of the pressure will certainly help. Now, the patient will also need some treatment at the muscle level because she'll have very tight muscles. So things like acupuncture, deep tissue massage, and obviously the postural advice. Now, one trick I get, and I'll, I will say this here, for some patients who have you know, more chronic pain, 10 to 20 years of neck pain, I also occasionally add in a soft collar. Now, the soft collar is not to wear all the time, but it's to be placed whenever they're cooking in particular, because when you cook, you have to look down. And the front of the soft collar absorbs the pressure. So while we're in this position looking straight ahead, we have five kilograms of head weight, 50 newtons per second going through our cervical spine. When we go in that, 
it's 500 newtons per second. So if you calculate that over minutes and hours, uh, you're putting a lot of impulse forces on your base of your neck. And this really needs to be explained to people. Would you consider medication in this patient? And what, what would you start with? Absolutely. Look, I would start with probably, um, she's probably tried Panadol. Mm -hmm. She's probably tried maybe low-dose neuro, um, neuro ibuprofen or other non-steroidals. Um, I'd probably perhaps go to a slightly higher dose of non-steroidals, especially when the pain is severe. So mm -hmm. on a good day, I certainly would. On a bad day, I certainly would say take some analgesia. I would also trial uh, perhaps codeine or tramadol because she's had pain for a year and a half. Some days it's getting up to 7, 8 out of 10. It's distressing. And if you have pain that's 7, 8 out of 10, it's going to cause distress and a sympathetic response, and that's going to wind back and create more pain. Mm -hmm. So when it's severe, we really need to target it a bit more. Mm -hmm. In terms of pain modifying medications, I didn't need them. And certainly in the first instance, I wouldn't go there. If I was, say, three months down the track and things haven't been moving, certainly I would try amitriptyline, small doses, mm -hmm. uh, and et cetera, depending on how she um, manages. Mm -hmm. um, any particular challenges about an adolescent patient? I think the challenges are that we really probably don't want to go to medication in the first instance uh, for most cases. Mm -hmm. I mean, in a patient with perhaps complex regional pain syndrome, I think we have to um, be more flexible. But in patients with biomechanical musculoskeletal pain, mm -hmm. which is, has a certain pattern about it, in this situation, I think we should try and alter the biomechanics first mm -hmm. and use simple analgesia. Mm -hmm. Things like the oral contraceptive pill, which was mentioned for this patient, do you are you concerned about that with any of the medications that you might potentially use? Um, the main thing is probably Tegretol and some of the others uh, in terms of patient becoming pregnant. Yeah. I'd certainly avoid any medication sure. uh, because there are probably several we can use. Mm -hmm. um, so those ones I'd certainly avoid in this case. And the ever-present opioids. <laughs> I, I, I have found over the years probably... Uh, it's the latter. You know, you might start with Panadol, move up to Brufin, uh, Ibuprofen rather, or another non-steroidal. And then if that wasn't giving her any effectiveness when she has some days at 7, 8, 9 out of 10, I would I would sort of jump to codeine or Tramadol. Mm -hmm. um, that's probably as far as I'd go initially uh, and certainly give the biomechanical stuff a trial. Things like this collar, where, where can you... They're available on websites if you just look up Google them. We do have them on our website, fixyourstress.com. Um, but basically, um, yeah, they're available. And there, are there any uh, risks or contraindications to using a traction collar? Not really. I think <laughs> trial error. You don't want to blow it up too much so that it really hurts. I think a moderate amount of traction is fine. Uh, and then you can build up a little bit if you want. But probably regular use. Sometimes I get patients to use them at work. They can use them in their lunch breaks, in their tea breaks, if they're getting a lot of pain and unable to do their computing. So they're relatively versatile. <laughs> Not really a fashion accessory, <laughs> but uh, nice and simple. And there's been one more question about um, a TENS machine. Do you use tennis, TENS machines and what's the effectiveness that you're aware of with TENS? I certainly have used TENS machines. Um, and I think there again, I think it's more individual. Um, I, I know in some of the trials where one trial trial um, pitted TENS against traction for low back pain and found there was no effectiveness for TENS um, and there was no improvement in pain, whereas the traction was about a 60% improvement. Um, so I think it's horses for courses. I think at the end of the day, um, it's worth trying. And especially, it depends on the patient totally, you know, like if, if it's in the last case, I didn't need to try anything more, but if it's dragging on a little bit and she's got a lot of muscle tension, then certainly I like TENS in that it's a self-treatment. Yes. Once you've got the machine, um, you can do it at home every day. I think that's, um, and I, I often say it's like an electric massage. I, I, might, I might be wrong there, but <laughs> that's one of the ways in which I, I sort of suggest it to people, so 
instead of having to use a lot of acupuncture or deep tissue massage, this may be one modality that can affect some changes in the muscle and perhaps in the pain system as well of the spinal cord. We've got about 10 more minutes. Just any last questions that people have, can they start sending them through? I've got a couple here that are more general. One of them is about long lists of medications that people with chronic pain often end up on. Um, and that is there a tendency for people to add in medications rather than have, remove medications before trying something else or something um, new? I think this is quite common. And, you know, I have seen cases present with uh, 60 tablets a day. And, I remember many years ago, a young lady was oh, probably 30, had uh, two or three children to look after. <laughs> it's getting a little bit difficult. <laughs> and uh, this was in my early days of doing my PhD. So I'd started doing some reading on the sympathetic nervous system, saunas, um, and other modalities that may help. Um, so for that particular patient, I remember saying, hey, uh, why don't we try going to toilet and doing a little bit of aqua jogging? Maybe jumping in the sauna or steam and if you could with that for 10, 20 minutes, two or three times a week. Uh, and let's just see if we can alter the sort of um, sensitization in your brain naturally. And so she did that and um, over six weeks um, she found that her sleep improved a little and her pain improved a little bit. Um, and in that situation we had her down to half a tablet a day uh, in six weeks. Um, but she was compliant and keen to do this. So I think in patients that are doing nothing to reduce their sympathetic tone, uh, and what I mean by, as I said before, sauna, yoga, tai chi, meditation, and exercise above 50% uh, maximum heart rate. So walking doesn't generally reduce sympathetic tone uh, unless you're sort of walk running. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so sometimes people with pain though, they can't always walk at a fast clip. Um, so generally speaking, most people uh, who are not heat and tonic can lie in a sauna. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I find that one of the easiest ways. And most people can get into a swimming pool and probably walk up and down the swimming pool. I think that's reasonably okay. You do get the odd person with chlorine allergies, so there are some difficulties. And you get people with heat and tolerance. So mm -hmm. over the past few years, as I said, I've been writing a book on insomnia, anxiety, depression. So I've looked at all the literature on reducing sympathetic tone and fortunately you know there's quite a few things out there and meditation can be done lying in your bed and I think most of us can do that for sort of 20 or 30 minutes a day would be a reasonable dose for meditation and along with meditation I'll, I'll speak a little bit about breathing. Um, the simplest form of meditation breathing I give patients is to place their hand on their tummy basically breathe in for five seconds and out for five seconds. And when they breathe in, they should almost push into their tummy so they feel their tummy rising. Uh, and basically when they breathe out, their tummy falls. And there's actually research showing that, uh, and, and it's weird what you find in the research, <laughs> but uh, there are studies which have measured sympathetic tone using heart rate variability. And what they've done is had people breathing five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times a minute. <laughs> and what they found was that breathing five to six times a minute, basically after 20 minutes, will reduce your sympathetic tone. And so hence, uh, just lying on your bed, breathing like that, five seconds in, five seconds out. And even if they count to five while they're breathing out and five while they're breathing in, pretty simple. Mm. And uh, that's a nice, easy one that requ requires no money and nothing and it does work but also while we're trying we're talking about self-treatments there's a lot of research out there for hand warming for headache yeah. in fact there was a little book in the library uh, written in 19 i think it was 1968 perhaps and when i was doing my phd i was the first person to take it out of the library <laughs> and uh the way heat works is by vasodilatation. So a sympathetic activation, vasoconstricts the hands and feet and creates cold hands and feet. If you dilate the blood vessels, it feeds back to the brain, reduces the output of stress chemicals. This is the same as breathing. So when we breathe fast, <laughs> it's like we're chasing, we're being chased. And so our brain thinks we're in danger. And if we're breathing very slowly, our brain thinks, oh, there's nothing wrong. Mm. And so 
hand warming dilates blood vessels. So basically you can rub your hands together, place them in hot water, you can have a heat pack, warm it up and hold it. And uh, I've suggested this to many people and they can do it frequently during the day. And in fact that will reduce sympathetic tone over time as well. Mm. And that's another very simple thing to do. There was something mentioned uh, a wee while back about um, how we can we look at avoiding patients going on this chronic pain journey and, and um, can we avoid it, I guess, and how do we go about trying to prevent this as, as a society? Um, do you have any thoughts on this? It's quite a large question, that one. Look, um, uh, certainly my aim is to, uh, and, and the reason I started the New Zealand Pain Foundation was to do research and uh, I've moved to Auckland from Wellington recently um, to work with Auckland University um, to look at research on simple self-treatments uh, on chronic pain conditions such as uh, headache, migraine, neck pain, back pain, as well as actually looking at insomnia, anxiety, depression. Uh, and I think um, we need to do research on simple self-treatments because uh, we may not be able to help everyone in chronic pain, but even if we could have a third of people who have chronic pain uh, getting better, then that would be uh, go a long way towards this. Mm. And that's the reason um, why I've started a website. We've also written some books for lay people, and we're going to get videos on our website soon as well. Uh, Two-minute videos, which are easily digestible, which have you know how do I perform traction for the lumbar spine? What can I do? So we are going to try and. Uh, get some of this education out to the masses so they can try simple self-treatments at home. I, I believe personally that's probably the only way to address this mm. on a population basis is to look at causation uh, and to look at uh, ways in which we can particularly affect uh, musculoskeletal pain which has a biomechanical loading pattern. There was um, also a mention about the ACC approach. Um, they advertise something called positive thinking for people who have chronic injury. Is that, what are your thoughts? Oh, look, we need to be promoting positive thinking. I think um, there's no doubt about it. Um, we need to be promoting uh, mindfulness, positive thinking. Uh, we need to be promoting people having gym memberships, perhaps going to the swimming pool regularly. Um, this, you know, and, and I've talked to um, politicians and councillors, even sort of cheap pool access for people who are on sickness benefits and invalids benefits and people who have gone the downward spiral because even 10 to $20 a week for them attending the swim pool three or four times a week with transport, uh, out of their budget, that's too much. And I think uh, we do need to address this uh, at a government and uh, a council level, local council. So I have worked with um, local body councils and I think this is the next step over the next few years is to look at policy makers and see what we can do uh, at a society uh, level to alleviate people who have uh, been disadvantaged with chronic pain syndromes as well as special aid disorders. There's a couple of cases here to finish up and then we'll do our um, sure. take home messages. But the first one here is a patient with low back pain after an injury. He developed headaches after several months on regular paracetamol, anti-inflammatories, nortriptyline and tramadol. Um, no history of migraine previously. And the wonder is whether they've developed an analgesic overuse syndrome. I think that's certainly a big possibility. And in fact, I gave a podcast on headaches, which will be on the Goodfellow site. And that talks a little bit about medication overuse headache. There's two possibilities. Um, the low back pain, if it's chronic, it'll be creating a sympathetic response, and that can amplify headache pain mm -hmm. for someone who's um, who's prone. Uh, and the other thing is certainly things like paracetamol, non-steroidals, opioids, um, and, and tramadol, and probably any analgesic can create medication overuse headache, whereby two things are happening. Sometimes they withdraw from the analgesia overnight, so they have a headache in the morning. Sometimes what happens is that the pain receptors become more sensitive and they have this sort of um, different reaction. 
The second case here is a 21 year old who's recently been diagnosed with fibromyalgia. She was prescribed ibuprofen, codeine and diclofenac, which didn't relieve the pain. Uh, she was then commenced on gabapentin recently. And is it possible for her to be still referred through to the Wellington Pain Service? And what is your what are your thoughts on gabapentin at, for someone on such a, at such a young age? Long-term gabapentin. I think at the end of the day, as I said, um, I would certainly be looking at um, doing the non-pharmacological um, things that reduce sympathetic time uh, if she hasn't tried them um, that I've mentioned in this pod, uh, in this webinar. Uh, and hopefully if she starts doing those, uh, then hopefully things will settle down. Uh, I think uh, long-term medication, I think firstly we need to talk about uh, trying to reduce her symptoms because obviously if her pain is 7, 8 out of 10, She's in a lot of distress, and if we reduce it to five with medications, uh, she's going to feel a lot better. So it's going to help her on her way. And I think uh, we're really just trying to help her on her way while maybe we find out what's going on. Mm. Uh, maybe see if there is a biomechanical path to her symptoms, um, seeing what the cause is. And, and I think that's you know not always easy to do, but that's uh, where we need to go. Do you want to whip through our sort of take-home messages at the end there? Sure. Which I think we've addressed most of. I think, firstly, um, you know, we do need to use all the tools in the toolbox, especially for chronic pain and people with lots of distress. Um, I think we probably need to think about the non-pharmacological treatments. I think with some of the research that I've done in the model in terms of sympathetic activation, it gives us a nice little model to say to people that, hey, look, um, pain produces stress, stress increases pain, and produces stress problems. So, you know, there's these five or six things, they can reduce your stress in your brain and your body. So, you know, let's see if we can start doing them. And I think that's that's vital. So it's got a, it's a nice explanation, which when I give to people, they're often more than ready to do them, uh, and the, the uptake is good if they're explained why they're doing it. I think that's the key. Once they sort of a handle on this explanation I think oh I might do this there's a there's a good reason so I think that looks at lifestyle factors um, patients you know I think with lifestyle sometimes we get people who are type A and they're working uh, they're doing some study <laughs> voluntary work uh, and you know sometimes we need to look at that as well and say hey um, and then they've got pain so They've got this stress going on and their lifestyle needs to be looked at in, in, in full. Mm. What is causing the stress? Uh, because we're not, uh, we don't see patients with just pain. We see patients with lives and their lives impact them quite heavily. Uh, psychological strategies are important. Um, and I think sometimes people with recurrent headaches, it's very good to get them uh, to go to mindfulness courses maybe see a CBT practitioner so they can get self-management skills so that hopefully over time they'll have less reasons. Medication should be used individually. Uh, we are dealing not with randomized control trials. We are generally dealing with individuals. And as long as there's some evidence for that medication in that type of patient, I think then we can go on and basically use it uh, in that condition which we see in our patient, but knowingly that not everyone's going to respond and not everyone is going to be able to tolerate it. And then we move on to the next one if we need to. And all the while, hopefully, if we can find a biomechanical source of musculoskeletal pain in particular, we try and address that. Remember, we're not going to be able to do this uh, as much with people with neuropathic pain uh, and other pain syndromes. But certainly with musculoskeletal biomechanical, biomechanical pain, we may be able to. And I think our focus has to be on non opioid medication as it is at the moment. Um, and I think this is for obvious reasons for dependence, tolerance, uh, and the risks that it's posed to people in overseas, Australia and the US in particular. Thank you, Gareesh, for taking your time tonight and discussing such an important and really complex topic. I really appreciate it. It's a pleasure, Helen. Thank you for having me along. Mm -hmm. And I hope someone can take, uh, the audience can take something out of this talk tonight. 
If you do have any questions, you're welcome to go on to fixyourstress.com and email me and I'll answer your questions um, and, and give you any advice that you need for the uh, family that's been <laughs> unwell judging from some of the questions. Um, next Tuesday is a FACT webinar on focused acceptance and commitment therapy with Kirk Strosel uh, and we shall see you then. Thank you very much. Thank you.